always remember that you are the thing and the absolute, unconditional, boundless, irrevocable property of Immaculate One. You are a tool in her hand, so act only according to her will. Accept everything from her hand. Take refuge in her, like a child who always takes refuge in its mother, and trust everything to her. Strive for her, for her honor, for her affairs, and the care of yourself and your kin leave to her. You shall not give yourself credit for anything, but recognize everything is received from her. All the fruit of your labors depends on the unity with her, just as she is the tool of God's mercy. Life, every moment of it, death, where, when, and how, and my eternity, they are yours, O Immaculate One. Do with all of it whatever you wish. On August 14, 1941, in a starvation bunker of the German concentration camp Auschwitz, Father Maximilian Maria Kolbe died, killed by a poison injection. He was the founder of the Knights of the Immaculata organization, the monthly magazine Night of the Immaculata, and the Nepokalanov Radio as well as the world's most numerous monastery in Epokalanov. He voluntarily chose death by starvation in exchange for the life of a condemned fellow prisoner. For most, Maximilian Kolbe remains primarily, but sometimes only, a martyr. Meanwhile, his rich life story could be shared by several people. In all areas he dealt with, he did not recognize compromise. Entering the order, he took the name Maximilian, which in Latin means the greatest, and this name perfectly characterizes his future activities. In some orders, the family or the masculine orders, the prior uh, doesn't have a chance to, to choose the name, but the provincial give the name. And uh, I think it is in, uh, happened the same in the case of Maximilian. He got the name not because he wanted to, to be called Maximilian, but he received his name and the providence maybe started to, to, to modify his life and, and to perform his life according to, to this, uh, this name which he received with the first profession. Father Maximilian never set intermediate goals for himself. Everything was to be maximal. In 1920, he wrote his Rules of Life with the notation, read every month. The first point of his life creed was, I must be as holy as possible. How did it come to pass that this humble monk, who came from a poor family and did not have any affluent and powerful sponsors, created the work that still inspires amazement and admiration today? Yeah, because what made him strong is not that Christianity is only an idea, a production of, of human thinking, but Christianity is based on the reality of the acts of God, who was our creator, and he is our redeemer, and who will fulfill us and uh, become the perfection. It happened in the village of Zdunskovola on January 8, 1894, at four in the afternoon. Julius Volbe, 23 years old, a weaver by profession residing in Zdunska Vola, appeared in person. He presented us with a male child, declaring that he was born in the village of Zdunska Vola at 1 a.m. today, of his married wife Mariana Ne Dombrovsky, age 24. The child was given the name Raymond at baptism. Raymond Kolbe's family belonged to the middle working class, 
Both of his parents, his father Julius and mother Mariana, came from families of weavers. In compliance with his memoirs, Julius was handsome and friendly and played the violin amateurishly. He was also energetic, enterprising, and hardworking. Mariana Kolbe had a more complicated personality than straightforward Julius. She did not feel called to have a family and dreamed of becoming a nun. However, this was impossible. The Russians abolished convents in the partition territories as part of their repressive measures. Mariana did not perceive marriage as it is today. For her, it was primarily a sacrifice for her husband and children, a sacrament she naturally chose, unable to become a nun. With, uh, uh, they try to, to uh, educate uh, uh, their uh, children according not only to the faith, but uh, also according to the, a kind of high educated standard of, of living. At the turn of the century, the Kolbe family lived successively in Zdunska Vola, Wuj, and Pabianice in the Russian partition. Kolbe's father Yulius was active in the Association of Christian Workers, founded by Father Matsele Godlevsky. By the way, a priest accused of anti-Semitism, who during World War II helped save several hundred Jews, becoming a righteous among the nations. Priests such as Father Marcele Godlevsky, Father Vavzheniak, and many others are undoubtedly people who greatly inspired the next generation of Polish priests, including Father Maximilian Kolbe, who grew up facing reality particularly affected by poverty and injustice, that is, the reality of the working-class communities of Łódź, Pabianice, and nearby towns. In his childhood, an unusual event occurred, which Mariana Kolbe described years later. Trembling with emotion and crying, he tells me, when my mother told me, what would be of you? I asked Our Lady, what would be of me? And then when I was in church, I asked her again. Our Lady appeared to me holding two crowns, white and red. She lovingly looked at me and asked if I wanted those crowns. The white one meant I would persevere in purity, and the red that I would be a martyr. I replied that I wanted them. Then Our Lady looked at me pleasantly and disappeared. Little Raymond Kolbe certainly did not anticipate how momentous this choice would be. That's, that's a profound statement of faith of confidence in the redeeming power of Christ and of confidence that we are led to Christ through his Immaculate Mother. Raised in such a patriotic and religious atmosphere, the young Kolbe brothers directed themselves toward serving the fatherland, preferably through service to God. So it happened. All three escaped to Lvov in the Austrian partition, where they began their studies at the minor seminary of the Franciscan Fathers. Raymond was 13 years old at that time. Maximilian Kolbe came from a deeply pious family. He seems to have had profound religious experiences as a young man that shaped his dedication to our Lady under the title of the Immaculate Conception and his dedication of his life to the Immaculata. Even as a cleric, he felt a call to fight for the Immaculate, but he did not know what kind of struggle he should undertake. 
And in the boarding house in the choir where we listen to Mass, with my face on the ground, I promised the Blessed Virgin Mary, reigning in the altar, that I would fight for her. How? I did not know, but I imagined fighting with material weapons. In 1912, as one of the most talented, he was sent to study in Rome. When World War I broke out two years later, Kolbe's older brother Franciszek finally abandoned the order and joined the army to fight for a free Poland. So did their father, Juliusz, who died in unclear circumstances. Maximilian Kolbe recalled that being sent to Rome was a providential decision. Had he stayed in Poland, he would not have endured in a convent, but like his older brother, he would have fought for Poland. His life would have taken a completely different course. The end of the First World War marked the complete disintegration of the existing world order. The old superpowers collapsed, new states appeared, and borders and social and economic relations changed. Free Poland rose, for which Maximilian Kolbe desired to fight. At the Versailles Conference in 1919, a Polish delegation, headed by politicians, Roman Domowski and Ignacy Jan Paderewski, was among the 29 countries. And all the Allied countries recognized Poland as an independent state. After 123 years, we regained our independence. The event that had a decisive impact on the young Franciscan was the celebration of the 200th anniversary of Freemasonry. The Vatican was besieged by thousands of people carrying banners depicting Satan knocking down Michelangelo and the inscription, Satan must reign in the Vatican and the Pope will be his servant. Maximilian came back to the college and talked immediately to the rector of the college, Father Vignuti, and uh, uh, confessed to him that, uh, that he has an idea to do something to defend uh, Our Lady and the Church, and also to fight uh, the spiritually for the glory of God. That's why he formed the Knights of the Immaculata. That was not a, an exclusive club. Uh, that was something that ordinary people could become part of, express their Catholic faith through, and exercise their baptismal responsibility to be missionaries. Thus, with the permission of Father Rector, the first meeting of the first seven members was held on October 16, 1917. It was held in the evening, secretly, under lock and key in the second inner cell. A statue of the Immaculata between two glowing candles stood at the head. Activities during this first time in the life of the militia consisted, in addition to private prayer, of distributing medals of the Immaculate, known as the Miraculous Medal. The Miraculous Medal of the Blessed Mother, minted since revelations of the charismatic St. Catherine Le Bourg in 1830, played a crucial role in Colby's spirituality and his concept of the Knights of the Immaculata, and later, Nyepokalanov. They discover in this uh, Miracles Medal as a kind of, of, uh, of arms, no? uh, to, to promote and to fight against the, the evil, against the sins, not with, with, with uh, his own words, with his own, uh, his own forces, but with the help of Our Lady. Distribute her medallion wherever you can, to children, so that they always wear it around their necks, and to the elderly and young people in particular, so that under her protection they have enough strength to fend off so many temptations and snares lurking in our times. And to those who do not go to the church, or who are afraid to go to confession, who scoff at religious practices, who laugh at the truths of the faith, who are bogged in moral mud, or who are outside the church in heresy, to these it is necessary to offer the medal to the Immaculate and ask them to be willing to wear it. 
and in the meantime, earnestly implore the Immaculate for their conversion. Thus armed, Maximilian Kolbe returned in 1919 to newborn Poland, facing his greatest threat. War with the Bolsheviks, who had to defeat the Poles on their march to Western Europe. In 1920, Tukhachevsky, as commander of the Bolshevik army, and, on the other hand, Budione, as commander of the Second Front of the Bolshevik army, tried to invade Polish lands. Tukhachevsky invaded as far as in the vicinity of Warsaw in August 1920. It's important for people in the Western world to know that that Soviet project was really stopped by Poland the so-called miracle on the Vistula, the Battle of the Vistula River in 1920, when the Red Army was stopped by the forces of independent Poland, Marshal Pilsudski. Had that not happened, there wasn't much left to stop the Soviet Army, the Red Army, uh, between Warsaw and the English Channel. Uh, so uh, the Battle of the Vistula uh, was one of the great turning points in mid-20th century history. It was then that Kolbe realized that for Christian Europe, communism was a serious, if not more, threat than the Freemasons. Time has proved that he was right. In turn, those to whom the Lord God has lent some flexibility of pen and ability in any field of literature should also, united in separate circles, use these gifts of God to produce as much good press as possible in every field of literature. Father Maximilian Kolbe had a clear vision of evangelization of society through the mass media. He paid particular attention to the press, and the example of his father, Julius, was not without significance in this case. Father Maximilian was a true evangelist. In some respects, he anticipated what John Paul II would call the new evangelization. He understood that the church had to make its proposal out in the world and introduce people to Christ through whatever media of communications were available. And in the 20th century world, that meant the press. That meant creating a Catholic press that would uh, spread the gospel. Father Kolbe himself also wrote to his beloved Knight of the Immaculata. From his writings emerges a man who defines the way to achieve what we all seek in life in very plain and explicit terms. That is, simply happiness. It is significant that in the first and in the last issues of the Night of the Immaculata, Kolbe writes precisely about happiness. Everyone desires and chases happiness, but few find it because they do not look where it is. Man's heart is too big to be filled with money. Sensuality, or the deceptive though intoxicating mist of fame, it yearns for a higher good, boundless and everlasting. And such a good is only God. Delving into his texts, we can understand where his extraordinary strength came from, making real the saying that faith can move mountains. Perhaps the fact that he knew what happiness was, and it made him cheerful and smiling in most of his surviving photos. I should say that he was a very polyphonical personality. You know? He was serious when uh, he serious should be, but also at the same time when we met the, the young friars and in the time of, uh, of the, the free time after the work, he was a very joyful person. In 1927, Father Maximilian Kolbe convinced Prince Jan Drutsky Lubetsky to give part of his land to the Franciscans and the Knight of the Immaculata Organization.
he also obtained the right to establish a new monastery. Nipokolanov was built literally on bare ground, but at a rapid pace. On October 1st, Father Kolbe set about building a monastery, starting with a chapel near the statue of Our Lady. The brothers worked with the sacrificial help of the local population. On the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, November 21st, the monks moved in. On December 8th, on the feast of the Immaculate Conception, the new monastery, named Nepokolanov, was consecrated. During the move, Father Maximilian told his confreres, Nepokolanov is a place chosen by the Immaculata. Its purpose is to spread her honor. Everything, whatever is and will be in Nepokolanov, is her property. In this new monastery, our consecration must be profound. Religiousness must flourish there in all its fullness. It will be very modest in conformity with the spirit of St. Francis. Just two months after moving there, the brothers had already published the first issue of the Night of the Immaculata. It was already 70,000 copies. He tried to, to reach with, the new, with the, his newspaper everybody, you know, just to educate. Because the level of education was very, very low because of, of hard-working people, you know. They didn't have time to, to, to read. And they even, even didn't have the, 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 the books. For that, he, he published very, a very cheap the newspaper, you know. To, to permit to everybody to, to buy and to, to educate uh, through, through uh, to others and from himself and to discover uh, what kind of beauty everybody uh, has in, in his own life. The impressive flourishing of Nepokolanov is part and parcel of the development of the Second Republic. Poland made a remarkable economic leap from a backward agricultural country ruthlessly looted by the partitioners the construction of a modern state began. There was a focus on industrial development. They created Gdynia, the most modern city and port on the Baltic, a network of railroads, and a heavy industrial district covering 60,000 square kilometers, where hundreds of thousands of workers found their jobs. For Father Kolbe, these were the future potential recipients of his ideas. Nepokolanov became a monastery unique in its kind. Father Maximilian was authorized to receive novices in unprecedented numbers. So the monastery rapidly grew. At the same time, however, it was a monastery with a primary servant role to the Knight of the Immaculata. Nepokolanov existed so that the Night of the Immaculata could be published. And it grew so that the Night of the Immaculata could have an ever-increasing circulation, an ever-increasing reach, to reach more and more people. In 1939, the circulation of the Night of the Immaculata was exactly one million copies. Nepokolanov was practically self-sufficient, there were 760 monks and seminarians living there. The grounds of Nepokolanov covered more than 28 hectares. There was also no shortage of places of entertainment. There were volleyball, basketball, handball, and football fields. Father Kolbe did not play football but he liked to use a bicycle to move around the vast area of Nepokolanov. In 1930, Father Maximilian and four other monks embarked on a missionary journey to the Far East. After a long trek through India and China, they finally arrived in Nagasaki, Japan. Maximilian Kolbe was a, a very intense man, I think. 
insofar as I understand him. I think he lived a, a rigorous life of prayer, uh, devoted to the sacraments. And yet, someone who goes from Poland to Japan uh, is someone who is uh, willing to have an adventure, uh, to step outside the norm of a Franciscan life in Poland, and to be a, a missionary in a place that had been very difficult for Christian mission for, for hundreds of years. Father Kolbe's main idea was to start a branch of Nepokalanov there and publish the Night of the Immaculata in a Japanese version. Very few believed in the success of this mission. However, once again, Father Kolbe showed that faith moves mountains. Not only did he succeed against all odds in starting the publication of the Japanese Night, but most importantly, he founded a Franciscan monastery in Nagasaki, which still exists today. Monastery's Japanese name is Mugensai no Sono, which means Garden of the Immaculata. Divine Providence always provided solutions when difficulties seemed insurmountable, he noted with characteristic modesty in his diary. The Nagasaki Monastery played a significant role after the Americans dropped an atomic bomb on the city. The hillside on which it was built shielded the monastery from the effects of the explosion. The monastery was the site of the first of many orphanages established in many places in Japan by pupil of Father Maximilian's brother, Zenon Jabrowski, who is known in Japanese history as Zenosan. Zenon Jabrowski is an absolute unique figure, a worthy continuator of Kolbe's work. He was, like him, tireless and never gave up. During 84 years of his life, he helped thousands of orphans and the sick, becoming the most popular Pole in Japan. There were printed 350 articles and books with descriptions of his endeavors. For years of his charitable work, Brother Zenin received the fourth class order of the sacred treasure from the Japanese government in 1969. In 1936, after his return to Poland, Father Maximilian was re-elected guardian of Niepokalanów. Although the publishing house was already a real power in the Polish publishing market, the charismatic leader had new ideas for development. As always, with the spirit of the times, he kept a close eye on technical innovations and looked ahead with his thoughts much further than most of his contemporaries. A saint is not a savage nor a clunker to be pushed around. A saint must be active, darting, full of initiative. He began preparing Nepokalanov to broadcast the first Catholic radio program. The station aired the first trial broadcast in 1938. In the future, Nepokalanov was also to launch Attention, a television station. Father Maximilian was an interesting combination of a very traditional Franciscan with a very traditional piety and a man who understood that the modern world offered the church instruments, communication instruments, transportation instruments, uh, to spread the gospel. So he was not afraid of modern technology and yet he used that technology to preach the truths of the gospel, which are enduring truths, they're permanent truths. So he was, in that sense, a very modern priest with a very classical message. He later uh, took over, uh, John Paul II took, took over this great idea, this uh, great program of a new evangelization, but with the help of the modern techniques, with the broadcasts, and now with television, uh, social medias, that all are welcomed uh, medias for uh, the evangelization, for the preaching the gospel and for giving testimony. In the 1940s, according to Father Maximilian's plans, Nepokalanov was to enter a new, hitherto unknown stage of development. The monastery was to become a center of modern evangelization, 
brought about with the help of all available mass media. Knowing Father Maximilian's organizational skills, these plans had quite a real chance of coming to fruition. However, they were cut short by World War II. The dreams of his own television station and the further development of Niepokolanov, like the further development of the reborn Polish state, were abruptly interrupted by the outbreak of World War II. Poland became its first and most effective victim. It suffered the heaviest personal and material damages relative to its population and national assets. Sandwiched between two totalitarianisms, fascist and communist, it had no chance. On September 1st, 1939, it was invaded by Germany. And on September 17th, battered by a treacherous attack by the Soviet Union. A nearly six year period of tremendously bloody and brutal occupation began. Both the Germans and the Soviets immediately began to impose a reign of unprecedented terror. Both regimes sought first to strike those groups that could play a leadership and spiritual role in society. Only a nation whose leadership layers are destroyed will allow itself to be relegated to the role of slaves. Adolf Hitler, 1939. The Germans' goal was to completely Germanize Poland by removing the local population, Poles, and members of national minorities. It had been executed through their displacement and systematic extermination. The Germans murdered Polish citizens in a systematic and orderly manner. And it was part of the German policy against Polish intellectuals, against Polish leading groups. The first action, so-called Intelligenz Aktion, Action in Intelligentsia, which was to eliminate educated people in Polish society, also brought many arrests for the uh, monks, for priests. Then another action which spread in the general government uh, was, called, was having a code AEP. And again, that was to uh, eliminate the same groups in, uh, in these areas. So in many uh, convents, the Gestapo or the German police was coming with the prepared list of all the priests, monks and friars who were uh, living in, uh, in, in this uh, places. On June 14, 1940, the first mass transport of Poles to the German Auschwitz concentration camp began. At the same time, in the Polish territories the Soviets occupied, they used no less terror. In the so-called Katyn Massacre, more than 20,000 Polish prisoners of war, mostly army and police officers, were murdered with a shot to the back of the head. The scale of Polish human and material losses during World War II is incalculable. Nearly six million Polish citizens were murdered, including three million Polish Jews, which means that almost every fourth inhabitant of Poland perished. Cities, economic centers, and villages were totally destroyed. Warsaw, the capital city only, was 80% devastated, and 700,000 of its inhabitants were murdered. It amounts to the combined war losses of Great Britain and the US. They burned about 22 million books, and more than half a million individual works of art were looted, most of which have not been retrieved thus far. The German and Soviet invaders carted away literally everything, from clothes and furniture to entire factories, bridges, trains and train cars, and even railroad tracks and rail sleepers. Furthermore, after World War II, under pressure from Great Britain and the US, 
Poland had to cede 48% of its territory to the Soviet Union, losing some 178,000 square kilometers, including the cities of Lwów and Vilnius, inextricably linked to Polish culture. After the attack by the Germans and Soviets, Maximilian Kolbe and his Nipokalanov found themselves in German-occupied territory. As a representative of the church, he experienced the full scale of the persecution inflicted on the Polish elite. As early as September 19, 1939, immediately after the occupation of Nipokalanov, he and his confreres were arrested. Several months of wandering around various camps began. It can be said that the Franciscans were lucky. They were not executed like, for example, 24 priests from Chev. On December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, they were released and returned to Nepokolanov. Father Maximilian finds Nepokolanov looted and devastated by the Germans. Moreover, the occupiers directed there about three and a half thousand displaced persons from the areas incorporated into the Third Reich, including 1,500 Jews. Father Kolbe rushes into action, filled with unusual energy, and with his brother, he organizes aid and food and helps all those who need it. Already after the deportation of the displaced people, some Jews stayed hidden in Yepokolanov, and others found safe shelter in the countryside where they were supplied with forged documents. In these difficult days, Father Kolbe did not give in to oppression. He continued to try to do what he had been doing all his life. Preach the word of God and a miracle happens. The Germans granted a one-time permission to publish one issue of The Night. There appears a significant text written by Maximilian Kolbe himself. This is the very first article on happiness that St. Maximilian wrote, OMK. So here is the very last article he wrote on truth, Pravda, MK, and the very last thing he mentions on lasting happiness. And this was 1940-1941, December, January issue. In the latest issue of the Night of the Immaculata, Father Colby returned to his creed from the first issue. He wrote again about happiness and truth. Although not everyone loves the truth, it alone can be the foundation of lasting happiness. Lasting happiness. No man under the sun does not seek happiness. In fact, in every act we perform, happiness shines upon us in one form or another as our goal to which we naturally aspire. Happiness, however, founded not on truth, cannot be like untruth itself, lasting. Only truth can be and is the unbreakable foundation of happiness for both individual people and humanity as a whole. The publication of The Night of the Immaculata, which was the greatest happiness for Father Kolbe, probably sealed his fate. The Germans could not tolerate a priest having such a following among Poles. The second arrest of Father Kolbe took place on February 17, 1941. They sent him to Paviak, the largest German prison on Polish territory. There were about 100,000 people who passed through Paviak, of whom 37,000 were murdered and about 60,000 deported to concentration camps. Only 3% of the prisoners were released. At Paviak, Father Maximilian's ordeal begins. In January 1941, until beginning of April, I was in Paviak, in a cell in the third ward. I stayed together with a Jew named Singer. One day, the third prisoner was brought to us. It was a monk. I learned that it was Father Kolbe. Father Kolbe stayed with us for two to three days.
and during the morning roll call, an SS man came. We lined up as usual for the roll call, somewhere about a meter in front of the door, and Singer reported. The SS man was not interested in what Singer was saying to him, that is, about the number of people, etc., except that he immediately turned his attention to Father Kolbe. Father Kolbe was dressed in a robe and had a rosary. Pointing to the cross, he asked Kolbe, Do you believe in it? Father Kolbe replied that he believed. The SS man hit him in the face. Father Kolbe carefully repaired the rosary, which was torn by a German, with a thread from his robe and hid in a little bag. Shortly after, he saved one more life in Auschwitz through its use. On May 29, 1941, Father Kolbe was deported to the German concentration camp, Auschwitz. He got the prisoner number 16670. The Auschwitz camp was opened 10 months after the outbreak of the war. It was the first German concentration camp on occupied Polish soil. Together with the other camps of Majdanek and Stutthof, it was one of the main places intended for the extermination of Poles. At least 464 priests, clerics, religious, and 35 nuns were sent to Auschwitz. Father Kolbe was in a camp only 52 days, most probably. He was deported at the end of May, and at the end of July was the roll call, uh, when he offered uh, his life and uh, 14 of August he was killed here in the camp. During his short stay in the camp, Father Kolbe made himself memorable to his fellow prisoners. He talked, consoled and lifted their spirits. He wanted to arouse in them the will to live and survive. One of the most significant accounts comes from the then teenager Wilhelm Jelazny number 1126. Abused and physically ill, he wanted to commit suicide. Kolbe found out about it. At one point, he grabbed me by the shoulders, looked deeply into my eyes and said, You will live. You have to live, Jelazny recalled. It was then that Kolbe gave him a rosary hidden in a small bag. He said, you can use it for the next days. And this is what he did. He started to pray. And uh, this, this prayer, this, the words, uh, really supported him. Wilhelm Zelazny survived Auschwitz and kept the rosary. Years later, he donated the priceless relic to the St. Maximilian Maria Kolbe Church in Auschwitz. One of the most remarkable testimonies to the life and death of St. Maximilian in Auschwitz, Marianne Kowodzie's shocking work, Memory Clichés, Labyrinth, located in the basement of the Franciscan Monastery in Hermenge. Visual artist Marianne Kowodzie, then a 17-year-old scout, prisoner number 432, was one of the camp's first prisoners. For 50 years, he kept quiet about his past. In 1993, when he suffered a stroke, he returned to his experiences, creating a plastic story about himself and those who did not survive the death factory.
Marian Kowoji recalled he stood with Father Kolbe on one roll call. Saint Maximilian's expression of selfless love for an unknown husband and father of a family restored Kowoji's faith in humanity, which helped him survive five years in the camp. As he recounted, he believed that the Providence encouraged him to give witness to what he experienced and what happened to Father Kolbe. Out of the 260 works, as many as 46 he dedicated to the saint. This testimony in the picture speaks more than any other attempt to recreate those moments. In the last letter he wrote from the camp, Maximilian comforts and reassures his beloved mother. This short letter says more about the strength of his faith than a thousand words. My dear mother, at the end of May, I arrived with a transport to the Auschwitz camp. All is well with me. Dear mother, be calm about me and my health, because the good God is in every place and remembers everyone and everything with great love. It would be good not to write to me before you receive my following letter, because I do not know how long I will remain here. With sincere greetings and kisses, Raymond Kolba. One managed to escape. This prisoner was in Block 14A, the same block that I was. Lagerfuhrer Fritsch ordered a roll call. Then, Lagerfuhrer Fritsch walked in front of the ranks. He pointed me with his hand. I knew that I had already been selected. I said that I felt sorry to orphan by my children and wife. Some of the prisoners who were at this roll call, they, they remember the atmosphere, the tension, not to look at the SS, just look somewhere else, not to be noticed, stay in the back, try to look healthy, st uh, try to look straight, good for work, so not to be, to be chosen. It was fear, it was terrible fear. When there were already 10 selected and I with them, this one prisoner spontaneously stepped out of line, turned toward Lagerfuhrer Fritsch and stood before him. Lagerfuhrer Fritsch said, what does this Polish swine want? He replied in German, I want to go for one of the selected prisoners. Which prisoner do you want to go for? He turned around, pointed his hand at me and said, I want to go for this prisoner. And why do you want to go? I am lonely, and he has children and wife. They need him. The end of June, when the message was spread, it's going to be a starvation cell, the prisoners were having the um, imagination, what is it going to be like? So they are not going to be released, like from the other cells, when they could stay for uh, four or five nights, and then they would be sent back for the camp. No, this is very end. This is the terrible death uh, in pain because of starvation. The one who sacrificed his life for me was Father Maximilian Kolbe, his camp number 16670. When the roll call happened after the escape of one of the prisoners, when he decided to give his life, 
For many prisoners, that was a really shocking situation. Fighting for life every single day, trying to uh, keep for the next, to survive, to give life for someone else, it was uh, something they could not really comprehend uh, in this moment. So it was, uh, it was uh, met with uh, disbelief, with, uh, with respect in uh, many cases. How impressive Father Kolbe's sacrifice was proves another exceptional testimony. On September 19, 1940, Captain Witold Pilecki, a representative of the Polish underground state, allowed himself to be voluntarily arrested and sent to Auschwitz. His task was to organize the underground and pass on reports on the situation in the camp. Once upon a time, it happened that when they selected a young prisoner, an old priest came up from the ranks and asked the camp commandant to choose him and exempt that young one from punishment. The moment was so powerful that the prisoners from the block were petrified with astonishment. The commandant agreed, and the priest hero went to his death, and that prisoner returned to the ranks. Captain Witold Pilecki escaped from Auschwitz and delivered the report to the Allies. Along with Jan Karski's records, the Pilecki's account was the first eyewitness information about the Holocaust given to the Allies. Both accounts were ignored, despite Karski's meeting with the U.S. President. Witold Pilecki returned to Poland in 1945 to raise the anti-communist resistance movement. Captured, he was sentenced to death by the communist authorities in a show trial. The sentence was enforced. After World War II, Poland did not fully regain its independence. Left on the other side of the Iron Curtain in the Soviet sphere of influence, it waited another 44 years for freedom. The resistance of Polish society, which had a strong support in the Catholic Church, was instrumental in bringing about the collapse of communism in Europe. Solidarity, next to the fall of the Berlin Wall, is the most important symbol of this transformation. Since 1989, Poland has been free and fully independent again. It would not have been possible without people like Father Maximilian Kolbe. They were restoring faith in humanity in the face of total regimes whose main goal was to dehumanize their victims. The martyrdom of Father Maximilian is a well-known fact throughout the world. However, it is not generally known that Father Maximilian's beautification process was not based on the path of martyrdom, but on the path of heroic virtues. You look to his whole life and death, no? Like Jesus Christ, no? Is the first martyr or the, the origin and the example for all the Martyrs in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, uh, his uh, preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God and what he did, uh, did uh, for the poor people, for the ill people, and he helped everybody uh, to make present the love of God for everybody, to make the, the experience for everybody possible uh, of the dignity of the human life. That Every body, every single person has this predestination to become son or daughter of God in Jesus Christ. It happened for several reasons. 
But the most important is that the process proved that Father Kolbe's entire life was a path to sanctity. In this place of terrible suffering, Father Maximilian Kolbe won a spiritual victory similar to that of Christ, voluntarily giving himself up to die in a starvation cell for his brother. Finally, after many years, on October 10, 1982, Blessed Maximilian Kolbe was canonized as a saint and a martyr. Beatum Maximilianum Mariam Kolbe, Sanctum esse decernimus et definimus, ac sanctorum catalogo adscribimus, statuente seum in universa ecclesia, inter sanctos martires, via devotione recoli de bere, in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti.